Our scripture passage for this morning is found in the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 1, verses 21 through 28. Please follow with me as I read. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he, Jesus, entered the synagogue and taught. They were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, not as the scribes. Just then there, just then there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsing the man and crying out with a loud voice came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this, a new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread out throughout the surrounding region of the Galilee. May God add a blessing on the reading of his word today. Today I begin a three-part series called, based on the Christian faith. And I have found over the years that when I talk to a number of individuals, both in and outside of the church, and I say, you know, you know, you know what it means to be a Christian? Uh-huh. Well, what does that mean? And I get, well, you know. I don't say that to be mean. I say that because it makes me sad. These are people that I've known my whole life, older than me, been in the church longer than I've been alive, and cannot answer that fundamental question. What does it mean to be in the Christian faith? Is it believing certain creeds and scriptures or uttering certain prayers? Is it having a moving experience of God's mercy through Jesus our Savior? Is it asking Jesus into our hearts and doing good things? deeds? Is it being a just individual? Is it merely being a member of a congregation? Is it reading the Bible every day, being a good citizen, being baptized, or worshiping regularly on a Sunday morning? Is that what it means to be a Christian? These things are desirable and part of the Christian experience and practice, but one does not, these actions alone do not make us a faithful Christian. As I said, today I begin a three-part series on the Christian faith. And today and for the next two Sundays after this, I will examine the marks of what it means to be a Christian. I will consistently ask, what does it mean to have faith? I'll be asking this of myself and all of us who gather here on Sunday morning. To give a very general view of our heritage and history of being a Christian, it can be said that we are saved by grace and made effective by faith. God's grace is and should always be at the heart of our experiences in life, along with the hope that we have Jesus, our Savior, who walks with us each and every day. This grace, which is a gift that can be only given to us, never asked for or never earned, but we take this grace and we incorporate it into our lives through faith. But what does it mean to have faith? Well, let me start by explaining what a number of my professors who have passed away and are now going to roll over in their grave. I'm going to do the most unacademic thing I can. I'm going to tell you what faith is not. First, faith is not an intellectual pursuit or agreement of certain beliefs. Christian faith is not a statement about the nature of God or the works of Jesus. Simply agreeing with certain statements about God and Jesus does not make any one of us a Christian. Christian faith is not a blind hope that God will make our lives easy or that God will fix the ills, the pains, and the trials that we face. Faith does not protect us from illness, accidents, betrayal, stress, or even death. The Christian faith is not a belief that God will banish all the trouble from our lives. 
If then faith is neither an acceptance of a set of beliefs or doctrines, nor some sort of protective service from trouble, then what is faith? In its most simplistic, yet I believe most powerful understanding and explanation, faith is trust. Let me say that again. Faith is trust. When the New Testament speaks of faith, we would have a better understanding of the message if we would substitute the word trust for faith. For the Christian faith is a life where we put our trust in God at all times, in all places, and in all circumstances. In today's passage that I read, we find in Mark, he's pointing us towards this level of trust. It is the first recording healing of Jesus' ministry put down into pen by Mark, who was the first writer of the Gospels, and it points to Jesus' ministry as one of healing, a ministry which was first based upon trust, trust from the individuals who put their trust in Jesus. With the exception of Jesus healing this man possessed by demons, nine times out of ten when an individual came to Jesus and they would say, I need, I have this brokenness, I have a child who is sick, my mother has passed away, I have been cast out of my village, I cannot be part of my family, that which I was part to, close to, felt a belonging with, I can no longer be part of, help me. And Jesus would usually say, your faith has made you whole. Your faith has healed you. Faith, trusting in Jesus, trusting in God, is what makes us whole, what makes us believers, what makes us Christians. Those whom Jesus healed first trusted Jesus before he did anything. I mean anything. The trust preceded the healing. We, will trust, we have a tendency to trust an individual if they first prove their worth to us. Do this for me, make me happy, lift me up, and then I'll trust you. But that's not how Christian trust works. That's not how faith begins. The people trusted in the New Testament in the interaction with Jesus. They trusted Jesus before he did anything. The cycle of coming to God was... Jesus healed them. And it wasn't after the healing that the person had faith. It was before. The miracle of the healing after they placed and embraced him with trust. The faith came before the healing, not after. If we as Christians confidently hold to the idea that God can be trusted, then we must live lives that reveal that trust. Trusting God in our hardships. Trusting God when we hurt physically, emotionally, spiritually. Trust God when we struggle, when everything used to make sense and now it doesn't. A goal that we had set is now not fulfilled. We still need to have faith and trust in God. We trust when we simply have no idea how tomorrow will unfold. We'd like to plan ahead, fill our calendars, tick it off, you know, put it by our old Franklin Covey ideas, but sometimes that knowledge is not revealed to us. We don't know ahead of time. And to face that tomorrow, we can't wait for it to unfold to say, okay, God, I'll trust you. We need to first trust God to get us through. We need to trust God when we have nothing. We need to trust God when we have everything. We need to trust God when we feel alone. And we need to trust God when we are surrounded by friends and family. 
We need to trust when we feel abandoned and forgotten. And we need to trust when we are placed on a pedestal. Trusting no matter how hard we try to make it better on our own account, even in those times when God lets us fail, stumble, fall. In those circumstances, why? Well, the teaching is easy. It's very simple. We fail to put our trust in him in the first place. We must trust not only when we are the sunshine of God's love, but also when we are in the darkness of despair. When we look at this passage, this story of Jesus at work and all the things that he does, it is a story that marches us to the cross. And that march is filled with the very worst life has to give. The burden of pain, suffering, and death. And if we trust in the power of the resurrection where God has the last word and death does not have the final hold over us, then we are able to be a people who live in and by faith because we are filled with God's love by his grace. You see, God's doing it first. But for ourselves and our journey and understanding what it means to be a Christian, it has to start somewhere. So I'm going to put a challenge to you. I don't do that very often, but for some reason, I had, that's just where the writing went. And I kind of went, God, you're taking me out of my comfort zone. God didn't say anything, so I went, okay, I guess I'll keep going. First, as Christians, we have to place our faith in God. Now. Today. This moment. Not when you've had a chance to think about it. Not when you've had a chance to research it. Not when you've had a chance to Google it. Not when you've had a chance to go and have lunch and talk over with your friends about what Pastor Paul said today. If you're wanting to have the mark of of the Christian faith, you need to place that that trust in God now. Doesn't the old familiar Lord's Prayer say, give us today our daily bread? We are not to have worry or concern about tomorrow because there is a trust that God will give us what we need right now in this place. Jesus himself asked the question in the Sermon on the Mount, can any of the worry that you add, that you give, that you utter, that you spend time in, add a minute a moment, an hour, a day to your life? The answer? Nope. Not really. In fact, it wastes time. It takes things away. It doesn't allow you to feel the embrace that you're hungering for, that you need. Christian faith is marked by a quiet confidence that God's grace will be sufficient for today. It is a trust that embraces both today's joys and troubles and worries not about tomorrow because God's already got that one under control. Second, Christian, the Christian faith is we trust, we trust in God's very nature. Can anybody tell me what God's very nature is? It's a four-letter word. Starts with an L, ends with an E, has an of in the middle. What? Who said it? Love. God's nature is love. Not hurry up and wait. Not let me see how you get through this. Not let me see if this is to my advantage, what I'll gain something out of this. It is pure, unmolested, untainted love. I mean... As I was writing this, and I still have it playing in my, in my mind, for some reason, my mother growing up, God rest her soul, and I'm going to say this in a little frustration, when I would go to bed at night after all my homework was done and all my chores were done, my mother would decide to sit down at the piano and do a really bad job at tickling the ivories. She was a better alto and a clarinet player than she was an ivory tickler, and the room where the piano was, was just outside the door of my bedroom. So where did the sound go? Right into my bedroom, even with the door closed. 
And she would sit there with my sister and hammer out this very simple song, you know. Praise him, praise him, all ye little children, God is... And she'd stop, and my sister would sing, love, my mother, God is, my sister, love. And after the sixth or seventh rendition of that, I would finally get up and walk out and say, God might be love, but I'm not loving what you're doing. Please stop. She didn't. She kept right on playing. There are plenty of people and resources in this world that will argue that God's nature is not love. There are people who sit there and say that God is mean, vengeful, and demands perfection from us. But there's also the argument in the only, that the only the strong will survive, that our strength, our might, will always be victorious and make us right, and that the world is a dangerous and fearsome place. And yes, I will not disagree that strength is important, and that our world can be very scary, but it's something we should be smart about, not afraid of. But in all the things in this world that we need to stop and think and wonder about, should we or shouldn't we, God is not one of them. Because his nature and his name is a loving name, a faithful name, and a devoted name to each and every one of us. Finally, the Christian faith trusts God not only for this life that we are living right now in our crude corporeal form, but also in the life that is to come. True Christian faith is neither focused on heaven, is neither focused on heaven, and it is not used as a strategy to escape the fires of hell. It is simply trusting that God's love will not abandon us. It is bound to us when we pass from this life into the next. And it is because of this faith that Christians, all of us, can die with a sense of peace, not because of a belief in heaven, but because we have trust in our God who will not forget us, will not forsake us, will not cast us aside. As I was researching for this passage, I was looking for little anecdotal stories. I'd say a lot of them are more modern parables. This is a true story that took place. On March 1, 1990, Jean and Ken Cheney were attempting to negotiate a little-used road in the Sierra National Forest. They skidded off the road into a huge snowbank. The blizzard was swirling around them, and they decided to sit tight. And as they waited... For help to arrive, the couple began to keep a diary of their actions. They wrote, We begin to realize that we are on a road that isn't maintained during the winter. We have no idea what lies ahead. Another entry says, We're completely and utterly in God's hands. What better place to be? But during those days, they passed them by singing hymns together reciting the Bible verses that they could recall, and they spent a lot of time in prayer. Still, no one came to rescue them. On March 18th, Jean Cheney made a diary entry saying, Dad went to the Lord at 7.30 this evening. It was so peaceful, I just don't know how he left. The last thing I heard him say was to say thank you to the Lord. I think I'll see him soon. I can't see anything anymore. Goodbye. I love you. In a tragedy, and they trusted God even to the end. Jean was eventually saved, and she buried her father. This is the utter trust, the utter meaning of the Christian faith. It does not depend on a happy ending. It does not require rescue from ills. It trusts that nothing in life or death 
can separate us from the love of God that we have in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Can you think of any service, any gift, anything that a human being or human institution of this world can provide and guarantee us that God can't beat? We're talking about the ones who created the heavens and the earth. Yes, we need to trust him. We need to trust him now. Because who knows what tomorrow will bring. Will you all pray with me, please? Help us give ourselves to you, O God. And in our giving, allow us to trust you. Because every moment that passes from this very moment, while we may have it organized and planned in our planners for the day, it doesn't mean it's going to unfold that way. Help us to trust you with an assurity that you will not fail us and that everything you give us is exactly what we need. We ask this in your son's precious and most holy name. Amen. Faith is trust. Trusting that God said he will do what he will do, which is to love us. It is trusting that Jesus is our Savior, that he came and died for our sins and walks with us each and every day. Faith is trust that the Holy Spirit is given to us as a gift. It fills us so we can not only feel God's presence, but share it with others. God trusts us with what he gives us. We should trust that what God gives us is what we need. So as you go from this place, if you move on to your meetings for either Christian Ed or Search Committee or choir practice, or if you're buckling off the lunch, take what you've heard. Think about it. Pray about it. And if there's something there, apply it to your lives. But as y'all go from this place, do not be afraid to let them know that y'all are children of God. Go in grace. Be filled with his peace. Don't forget to congratulate Will for all the hard work he did for his God and Me program. Have a great week, everybody. Amen.